Hey, welcome to the church at Rock Creek Online. I'm Jason Curry. Let me reintroduce myself. It's been a few weeks. We've been doing student ministry, children's ministry things at Rock Creek. It's really been an amazing summer as, as we've sped back up to pre-pandemic speed. Yeah. And, so, and summer for uh, you, your ministry is just <laughs> off the charts. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. We're, we're reaching kids, taking students to the beach. And so thank you guys who have prayed and, and uh, um, given to help us uh, do that. If you want to be a part of what Rock Creek is doing by giving. There's uh, church at rockcreek.com. You can give. And if you got a question today, there's a number right there. Text us. Greg's got a great message beginning in a series called Living on God's Terms. And at first we want to go, oh, I don't know about that. But that's the best place for us to live. Absolutely. You know, the problem is that we want, all of us have this sin nature in us that wants things our way. My way. And when you try to live your way, yep. it is always going to be contrary to God's yep. way. We And yep. we know we come into the world like that. Children yep. and grandchildren Absolutely. are, I want it my way. Well, let me yep. pray for us, and then Greg's going to teach us. We're going to have a great time together. Father, we love you so much, uh, and we know that you love us. And you, you love us so much because you've invited us to live our life in obedience to you on your terms. And so uh, would you just open our eyes to see that that's what's best for our life is living on your terms. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, a few weeks ago, I was driving down the highway in my truck, listening to Christian music as I typically do, and and when I be, I suddenly became riveted, uh, Jason, to the words that I heard from this song uh, through the speakers, and uh, and so when I got back to my office, I wrote, I stopped and wrote some of the lyrics down, and and these are some of those lyrics: I want to be different, I want to be changed till all of me is gone. And all that remains is a fire so bright the whole world can see that there's something different. So come and be different in me. And I don't want to spend my life stuck in a pattern. And I don't want to gain this world but lose what matters. And so I'm giving up everything because I want to be different. I want to change. Hmm. I will tell you that message could be the national anthem for this sermon series. Mm -hmm. uh, it, the lyrics reminded me uh, of a conversation I'd had with Scott Landers a few years ago. Uh, you may remember Scott was the youngest son of uh, Arkansas automobile magnate Steve Landers, and we were all entertained watching uh, those two boys uh, banter back and forth with their dad, you know, trying to one-up him and never seeming to be able to accomplish that. But two and a half years ago, uh, Scott suddenly and unexpectedly died of a heart attack while at his duck camp. However, a, a few months before his death, Scott had called me asking if we could talk. So I drove down to the car dealership, went to his office, and behind closed doors, Scott expressed to me his desire to be different. I'd known Scott since he was five years old. I'd watched him grow up, but I'd never seen him the way he was that day. Scott was desperate to be different. He was now married and had two beautiful children, and they had rocked his world. They'd opened his eyes to a whole new set of values. Scott wanted to change. He wanted to be different. And in the depth of his heart, he knew that God had to be involved. But Scott was struggling in his effort to truly connect with God, so he called for help. You see, I'd, like I said, I'd, Jason, I'd known Scott since he was five years old, and mm. Scott, from the, from the time he was five years old, was a deal maker. He was always making deals. He was making deals with his babysitters. He made <laughs> deals with his mom and his dad. Heck, he made deals with me. He, he would make deals with the banker. If he couldn't get anybody to drive him down to the bank, uh, he would call up the president of the bank on the phone. I mean, what five-year-old does that? And, and he was doing that and making deals when he was five. And he had done that his entire life. He was used to, for the most part, dictating the terms. But he had run into a problem in trying to close the deal with God. And Scott's problem was the same problem many of us have today. See, deep in our hearts, we want the change that we know only can, God can bring. We want to be different. We want God in our lives, but we treat Him as a mere accessory to our already crowded lives. Mm. And that's not how it works. That day, I was able to explain to Scott what living on God's terms meant, and that God's terms were the only path to the difference he was so desperately craving. 
over the next three weeks, I, I want to have a similar conversation with you about what it means to live on God's terms. See, this series is not about someone else. It's about you and whether or not you are willing to accept God's terms. Let me begin this series by clarifying that the terms that we're going to be focusing on in this series are not my terms. They're not Rock Creek's terms. They're not Baptist or Methodist terms. They aren't Presbyterian or Pentecostal terms. They are not denominational terms. They are transformational terms that Christ himself explicitly stated. And while I've chosen the text from Matthew's gospel as our focal passage, those words of Jesus we will read in a moment from Matthew 16 were of such importance that they are actually recorded in the gospels of Mark and Luke as well. Now, before I read the text, let me set the context for Matthew 16 here. Jesus and his 12 disciples are at Caesarea Philippi at the base of Mount Hermon, the northern, northernmost part of Israel. It's the site of one of the most critical moments in Jesus' public ministry because it was there he verbally affirmed he was the Son of God. That public proclamation changed everything. It was a turning point because once his claim to be the Son of God was known, he became a dead man walking. He would be returning south toward Jerusalem into the teeth of those who would execute him on a cross. As Jesus began his trek south to Jerusalem, he began to prepare his disciples. The future would not be easy for them. Mm. What lay ahead would require more than a casual relationship with him. So he clearly lays out the terms of discipleship in our focal passage, Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 26. And so if you've got your Bibles, I encourage you to open them to this text. And if you don't, then uh, you can simply uh, follow along. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, if you did open your Bibles, I encourage you to underline verse 24, because you see in this single verse, Jesus clearly sets forth God's terms. And before we dive into the first of those terms today, let me address exactly who Jesus was talking to here, because I think that's important. Matthew only speaks of Jesus addressing his disciples, but in Luke's account, he hints that there were more there listening than those 12. And in Mark chapter 8, he states explicitly that Jesus called the crowd to join his disciples. Now, where did that crowd come from? Well, remember the context of the passage. Jesus and his disciples are at Caesarea Philippi, which had been a site of pagan worship long before Jesus arrived on the scene, long before Jesus' birth. The place was literally littered with as many as 14 temples built for ancient Syrian Baal worship. It was also renowned as the birthplace of the Greek god Pan, the god of nature to which a prominent temple stood, and ruins are still there of that temple to this day. And not to be outdone, a large white marble temple was built to worship Augustus Caesar, Caesar Caesarea Philippi. You see, Caesarea Philippi was a virtual religious cafeteria line from which people might choose the god they liked best. I point that out simply to draw a comparison to the pluralistic society in which we live today, in which many believe there are, it's not one, but many equal adequate options for God. One factor in making the decision always has to do with the cost. What's the price? What's the price if I choose this God? And in this text, Jesus was saying to them and saying to us now, if you want to follow me, this is the price. This is what is required. These are the terms. This is the offer. Take it or leave it. You either accept God's terms and follow Christ or you reject God's terms and walk away. That's the choice. And I probably don't need to tell you that many in our Western culture are not just rejecting God's terms. They resist God's terms. They resist anybody telling them what to do or how to live. So, 
Jason, I know that I know this isn't a new thing. This isn't just something for our culture. I mean, sure. all, you go all the way back in the Old Testament in the prophet Jeremiah. He talks about uh, you know how absurd it is for the clay to say to the potter, "Oh, you, you know, you did it wrong." Uh, so it's not new, but it certainly seems to me that there is a renewed boldness to resist God and what He says. Yeah. And so, where is that coming from, and where is it taking us? Golly, I think. Uh, you lean back. Was it? Uh, I was an intern at Bellevue. Adrian Rogers said, "The sin that used to sleek down the back alleys now struts down Main Street." That's that's exactly what I'm talking about. And yeah. so um, I I think that there's a couple things here. Okay. Um, number one, we've confused God's patience with weakness mm-hmm. um, to an extent, um, but I also think that the deception is uh, from the garden. Uh, Satan's trying to convince us that God's terms aren't best for us. And we want it our way. And when someone comes and tells you, hey, your way is really going to end in destruction, your end is really going to end in in hurt, Um, boy, there's a pushback to that. And then uh, you want to kind of dig in once you've defended that and and Mm -hmm. don't tell me what to do. You can't tell me, um, you know, uh, um, how to live. And Jesus is speaking uh, right in opposition to all of this, you can do what you want, whatever you feel, yeah. whatever you desire, um, and and he's saying uh, that's fine for the rest of the world, but it, but if you're going to take hold of what I'm offering, um, this is the only path. And uh, um, the other part, I think, Greg, is this: um, we um, preachers, mm-hmm. yeah. we got to own that. Yes, we do. Um, by by, by uh, coddling to that. And uh, we want to think that telling someone the truth is not loving, but telling someone the truth in a loving way, there's nothing more loving than that. Right. Um, but uh, but we do. We live in a culture that pushes back against that pretty hard. And I think I think part of this is it seems to me again. Uh, I'm a good bit older than you are, yeah. but it just seems to me in the span of my life that there has been a, an increasing resistance to authority in any form. Sure. Ju- uh, you know, I mean, uh, we I, I hear kids talking to their parents in days, I, I probably wouldn't be alive in here today if I had talked to my yeah. my parents that way. You know what I'm talking about? It's, it's not just a resistance toward God. It's a resistance toward anyone, as you said, telling me what to do. Yeah. We yeah. just have this resistance against authority in any form. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's got us at a perilous place here. I, I really do think it, when we drill down on each of these terms during this series that Jesus sets forth in this passage, we're going to begin to see why so many resist God's offer. So let's get started with God's first term this week. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. Mm. So write this down if you've got your notes downloaded. Term number one is deny yourself. Now, that's pretty blunt and bold. There's no attempt on Jesus' part to conceal this term somewhere in the small print. But at first glance, this sounds psychologically unhealthy, doesn't it? I mean, secular therapists emphasize we need to affirm ourselves. We need to believe in ourselves. We need to trust ourselves. We need to love ourselves. So what exactly is Jesus saying here? What does he mean when he says we must deny ourselves? And, and I point out, it's not an option. He said you must deny yourself. Let's begin with the word itself. This word deny is used in only two contexts in the gospel. This is one, and the other is when Peter denied Jesus when he was confronted by someone accusing him of being a follower. I don't know the man, Peter said. That's a denial. He disassociates himself with Jesus. So what does it mean here to deny yourself? It's as though you look in the mirror and say, I'm not with him. I'm not with her. That person in the mirror is not who I follow. It's not who I believe in. It's saying to the person in the mirror, I know you want to go first. I know you want your way, but it's not happening today. You deny yourself. Jesus says uh, that that's what we have to do. We have to deny ourselves. Now, most parents have a story or two. You probably do. I I do. uh, Of the reality called the terrible twos when the entire world revolves around a two-year-old. But let's be honest, we could also tell stories of the terrible 22s and the terrible 42s and 62s and even 82s. All of us have a terrible two inside of us. Jesus says, deny yourself. 
Deny that terrible two self inside you that thinks everything needs to revolve around you and your world, around what you want, around your desires, around you always getting your way. The Bible calls it the flesh and is the part of us that most often rebels against God. I, just this morning in my quiet time, totally unrelated to my message, I'm reading in, in uh, the gospel, uh, I mean the gospel according to Paul, <laughs> in, in the book of Romans, and it says, make no plans to fulfill the desires of the flesh. Mm. That's what Jesus was talking about. Paul got it. Yeah. Paul understood it. There's a lot of confusion today about who exactly our enemy is. I mean, if I were to ask you to stop right now and just write down on a piece of paper who you believe our, our, our primary enemy is, some of you would name a country. You might say Russia or China. You might name a country. You might name a politician. No names. You might name a political party or an ideology. But few, if any, would put your own name on that enemy list. We prefer to believe the enemy is out there somewhere. But there seems to be within each one of us an enemy which we tolerate. Jesus indicates the enemy is what might be called the self-life. Mm -hmm. That is what Jesus is warning us about here. So when Jesus said the first requirement, the first term of living on God's terms, the first term of following him was to deny oneself. He was saying, so write this down, say no to the self-life. Now, that may not be a term that you're familiar with. The self-life is an enemy to our souls. It's an obstruction to the spiritual growth and life we actually long for. So Jesus is saying we must disown or disavow, disassociate almost our self from this selfish self-life. It's, it's working against us. It's not our friend. It's the enemy. It's so serious and such an obstruction that elsewhere, Jesus didn't just say, you must deny yourself. He said, you must die mm. to yourself. Mm. A.W. Tozer, one of the finest Christians of the last century, says the self-life is comprised of the hyphenated sins of the human spirit. They are not something we do. They are something we are. And therein lies their subtlety and their power. Mm. He went on to specifically talk about what those hyphenated sins he's referring to are. It's the sins of the self-life are comprised of things like self-righteousness, self-confidence, self-sufficiency, self-centered living. Those sins are manifested as egotism, arrogance, pride, self-promotion, and the saddest part of this is such traits are often applauded today and exalted as signs of great leaders in every field, in business leaders, religious leaders, political leaders. In fact, they have often come to be identified with the gospel itself and our celebrity crazed culture. I mean, such sins can dwell deep within us, and, and that's why Jesus tells us you've got to deny yourself. It's where you start. You say no to the self-life. Die to yourself righteousness, your self-centered way. So, uh, Jason, here's the question. What, what makes this self-life so serious? What, what, why is selfishness so serious? We, you don't hear a lot of sermons on this topic. No. We, we, we preach uh, about sin, uh, yeah. and, and we name a lot of them, but this is not one that yeah. you hear a lot of sermons about. And yet, it seems to me, if I understand what Jesus is saying, it, it is really at the heart of of one of the most serious things yep. that's an obstruction to having a relationship with God. We do preach a lot about um, don't put anything else in your life at the center. Put Christ at the center. But we don't a lot of times go, hey, the, the uh, uh, most enticing idol to put there at the center is me. Yeah is to center everything around. And, and so um, selfishness in and of itself removes Christ from the center and foundation of my life and puts me there. Mm -hmm. And uh, puts uh, me focused on my feelings, my desires, uh, my wants. In Scripture, God says, hey, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, my ways are higher than... Uh, and so if we're going to live the life that God has called us to, it's going to have to be on His terms. Selfishness always... Selfishness always calls me to look to a person who can't really answer the, the, mm -hmm. the, the deepest parts of my life or bring purpose or forgive sin or value or all of those kinds of things. Satan would love for us um, to live our lives just 
Um, led by uh, what your heart say, what your feelings say, what do you desire, what do you long for, chase what makes you happy, and miss out on what God has for us. Um, and um, um, it's really dangerous, Greg. Well, and and we, the, the, it's so subtle, Jason. We we blame everything and everyone else for our misery and yeah. for our problems yeah. and and the trouble that we see and face and experience in life and we think it it it's that person or it's this person or it's this issue mm-hmm. and, and and we just keep skimming over the fact that we could be a part of the problem yeah and and I want you to think about like the 12 guys that he's talking to um, we have accounts in Scripture. Like at the initial calling, they left behind what what was yes. there. Yes. And so they had to take that that first step of faith. And when they did, they found um, that what they were really looking for in life, what they were really longing for, was not found in self. Mm-hmm. It was found in Christ. But and I know this is what you're talking about. That's the exact opposite. So, and we're kind of, we get a little bit in my wheelhouse because what, what we're telling the next generation when, when it comes to their emotions, feelings, passions, sexuality, any of it is, hey, whatever you feel, whatever you desire, whatever you long for, like you do you. Mm-hmm. And Jesus is, is like, it's not even, we don't even have to reach here. No. He's calling to the exact opposite of that lifestyle. And that, that is the enemy. Yes. That is the enemy yes, right is. there. Yeah. So the question, it seems, that each of us needs to answer at this point is how do I detect this sinful self-life? How do I know what I need to deny? Remember, this message isn't about someone else. This mm. message is about you. That's right. It's about me. There are, there are a couple of prevalent areas, uh, uh, prevalent words, actually, I think, of the self-life that are emerging in our world today that are hard to miss. The first one is very public. You see it and hear it everywhere. It's everywhere you turn these days. And and that's the first one we're going to look at. But there's a second word we're going to talk about in a moment that's a little bit more private. It's more secretive. And and it's one that we are very reluctant to admit. But Jesus' first uh, term for entering into an agreement with God to deny ourselves could not be more relevant. If we're serious about denying ourselves, it's going to require us to do this. Give up the rights, there's the word. Give up my rights of ownership. Give up my rights of ownership. We hear that word everywhere, my rights. Now, in all likelihood, that gives some of you an uneasy feeling. I mean, that's what we're fighting about a lot in America these days is I'm losing my rights. You see, there is within the human heart this root of man's fallen condition whose nature is to possess, always to possess. We covet things with a deep passion. The chief characteristic of the self-life is possessiveness. Mm -hmm. Jesus' use of words in this primary passage that we're looking at, the focal text, he uses words like save and lose, gains and forfeits. He uses that in the text. It's very revealing. Within the human heart, things take over. They crowd God off the throne of your heart. The pronouns my and mine seem harmless enough on paper, but their prevalence on our lips is significant. They express the source of our real trouble better than the best theology ever could. They're verbal symptoms of a deep and destructive spiritual disease that consumes us. It's my life. I'll do what I want to do. Mm -hmm. It's my money. I'll spend it however I choose. It's my body. I'll do what I want to with it. Look at what Jesus said in Luke 14, 33, where he is expounding on the terms, the cost of following him. He said, you cannot be my disciple without giving up everything you own. Those are God's terms. Discipleship is to be all in. It is to forsake everything in order to have Jesus. You give up your rights of ownership. Denying self, the very first term that Jesus gives us, if we are to enter into a transformational relationship with him, means we say no to the self-life. We say no to ourselves. That means we give up our rights of ownership. And perhaps now you're beginning to understand why our world and our nation, uh, our our community, our families are are coming unraveled. We have become fixated on this terminology of my rights. 
People are obsessed with their rights. And this isn't confined to the madness we see demonstrated on our streets on a regular basis. This obsession with our rights is no respecter of persons. It's not confined to the streets of our cities. It's also in the seats of our churches where congregations are torn apart by members who insist on getting their way. So we're church leaders. So Jason, <laughs> how does this happen to the church? Of all places, we're, we're, we identify ourselves as followers of Jesus. Yeah. Uh, and, and I love that you pointed out that when those 12 began their, their journey to follow Jesus, and it's about, they're about two and a half years into it now when he mm -hmm. gives them these words, uh, he's peeling back layers at a time, I think. Sure. But they had given up. They had sacrificed. They were sincere. But he also knows what was the turbulence that they were headed to toward in, in Jerusalem. And he knows they're not ready because they're going to get very defensive. Mm. And I think that's where that defensiveness, my rights, all, that does not play well in a relationship with God. No, it doesn't. And we get, I, I've said this in the last couple of uh, sermons. He needed to get Peter... Uh, to uh, not be cutting off people's ears, but instead to be right. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. there was he, Peter had already, Peter knows he's the Messiah, but he's still going to go. This is a constant battle, even for Christians, uh, for church people. Every day you wake up, and this is a process of dying to myself, right? Mm -hmm. And so if I, if I'm not careful, um, I can be enticed back into um, the sinful nature and, and living in the flesh. And it's very easy to spot, and you've done so so good at, at showing this to us, because it's always my way, mm -hmm. right? Um, and uh, I can be a pretty emotional guy. I remember there's little comments um, when you have mentors, people disciple in you throughout the years. Mm -hmm. um, I pulled up to church or something like that, and there was something that was bothering me, yeah. right? Let's say something, uh, I, I don't even know what it was. Somebody and, pulled out in front of you at yeah, the light or something, something like that. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 it was like something on our campus. Oh, okay, like the okay. Way. oh okay, yeah. And so I thought, I know what I'll do, right? Like, I'll complain to Mark. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I'd got about a sentence in, and he looked at me, and he said, there's lots of stuff I don't like about our church. You'll get over it. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, and I thought, oh, my gosh. Like, and for me, it was a maturity in him of this, mm -hmm. that, hey, even though I'm the, the senior pastor here, like everything doesn't have to be my way. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, everything doesn't have to be the way that, that I want it to. And that seems silly when we talk about paint colors or mm -hmm. carpet or um, what colors the mulch should be and all. But those kinds of things reflect the condition of our heart on the bigger things because, for instance, um, Someone ought to serve in children's ministry, but someone else ought to do that mm -hmm. because yeah. I want my, I, that's not what I want to do with my time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we should give, um, but someone else ought to do that because that's not what I want to do with uh, my money. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I'm, I'm going to say something a little bit abrasive here. If you get enough people like that in a church, it begins to die. Mm -hmm. Because a great church consists of people who have died to themselves yes. and have submitted their will to the Father, and they go, I don't want my way, I want God's way. And that's what sets us apart, Jason. Right. That's what makes us different. Absolutely. That's, that, I, I, I mean, it's, this is such a neat thing because, because you had just told me uh, yesterday, in fact, uh, that y your next series, which follows my uh -huh. series, is about being Diff different. Yeah. Yeah. And we had not talked about this. And we it. had not no, talked no, about no. this. But no. I'm, I'm telling you guys, the church ought to be different. Yeah. We ought to be different. Mm. And sometimes we're not. Mm. You know, Jesus is saying this is where you start. If you want a relationship with God, a transformational relationship, we have to die to our perceived rights that the devil has convinced us belong to us. But there's another symptom or word of the self-life that's easy to spot. It's incredibly prevalent, and yet it is more secretive. It is more private, and it's something that we are reluctant to admit, and it's the word control. Hmm. You know, no husband's going to admit that he wants to control his wife, and no wife is going to admit that she wants to control her husband. No mother or mother-in-law are going to admit that they're trying to control their adult children, and yet that sort of thing goes on all the you're, time. You're on your own right now. <laughs> it goes on. We don't want to admit it. Yeah. There is this diabolical desire to be in charge, mm. to not only control our own lives, but the lives of others. You see, part of denying yourself and saying no to the self-life is to, write this down, give up control. 
This is yet another decision that hits the nerve center of our lives because not one person listening to me likes the feeling of being out of control or the feeling of being controlled. Mm -hmm. We resist that. Most people prefer the driver's seat to the back seat. We want to be in charge. We want to call the shots. We want to be in control. We, we, we want to make the decisions. And Jesus is saying it doesn't work like that. If you want to be right with me, if you want to be right with God, God's in charge. We live by his terms, not ours. Saying no to the self-life means giving up control. Now, let me ask you a question. What has its hold on you? What's controlling you? What drives you? You see, it's possible to think that you are a God worshiper just because you attend church. But when it comes to a day-by-day affections of your heart, something or someone else may be in charge. They may be in control. And it's not always about being under the control of evil things either. Often good things have control Mm -hmm. uh, over us that they shouldn't have. And Paul David Tripp, one of my favorite authors, says that good things become bad things when they become ruling things Mm -hmm. or controlling things. So what's some examples of that? You know, something good... You yeah. know, uh, it's it's not anything it, wrong, but if it controls us, yeah. That in my life, and I, I, you you started by saying this this message is for for me personally, mm-hmm. right? So I've been listening like that. There's a saying that I say to myself all the time: uh, the good things in life still make bad gods, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and I can't yep. let them drive or, yep. or control my life. I mean, come on, uh, sports, yep. uh, hobbies. Um, entertainment. How much time have I spent on my phone? How, am, am I neglecting time with God? There is so, just um, all of the things um, that God has created that that are good in and of themselves can be perverted and altered if that's where we go for life, if that's where we go for our purpose, if that's where we go for our mission, calling, and if it becomes a distraction, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And we look back on our life and go, man, I, I'm really not living for anything but my self. self. Yeah. <laughs> and then we've missed it. That's it. That's yep. it. It's a, it's the prominence that we elevate these things mm-hmm. or sometimes even people to people, in our lives. Yeah. Hot, you know? It could be all kinds of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I mean, do you want to be different? It starts by denying yourself. Saying no to the self-life which requires you to reposition your heart and give up control. In the gospel, God offers you something that nothing and no one else can offer you. He offers you life, Mm -hmm. abundant, eternal life. But it requires you to deny yourself. You must deny yourself, give up control, because you can never do for yourself what what Jesus is offering to you. Now, Listen again to what Jesus said in verses 25 and 26. He said, For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whosoever loses his life, gives it up for me, will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world? Holds on to all of his rights. Still in control, but forfeits his soul. Don't fight the growing pains of a relationship with God. Say no to the self-life. Now, the flip side of this first term Jesus gives us is not just that you say no to self-life, but you say yes to the God life. So you ask, well, what does God life mean then? It it simply means to live your life as God designed and intended you to live it. And when we do, we become part of the solution and not part of the problem. We become different. See, the day you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior is one of the greatest days of your life. Because not only are your sins forgiven, but God puts his spirit inside you. I love the way the Apostle Paul put it in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He said, or, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. See, this is why you no longer insist on your rights of ownership. You've been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. You don't own you anymore. Mm. Jesus has ultimate rights. This is what Jesus meant when he laid out the terms of discipleship at Caesarea Philippi that day. We deny our self-righteousness, our self-sufficiency, our self-confidence, and we sign the title of our life over to Jesus. This isn't always simple or easy. It can be tricky. Actually, I think it's a lifelong process of learning to walk by the Spirit rather than the flesh. 
Every day of your life, you will have the opportunity to say no to the self-life and yes to the God life. But you won't always do that. But if you do, you will be radically different. Listen carefully. This life is not won by fighting. Write this down. Living the God life requires you to surrender. Now, I know that sounds rather bizarre because surrender is a term we associate with defeat. We wave the white flag, we give up. And yet in the end, Jesus promises us that by surrendering to him, we will possess everything. Mm. In the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. This is more than a Bible lesson. It's more than preacher taught. This is the gospel. This is the good news, God's blueprint for your life. This is what it means to live on God's terms. It's a path navigated one day at a time, one step at a time, one decision at a time. It's it's highly unlikely that any one of you listening to me right now are going to walk away from today's message having instantly mastered this journey. It just doesn't work that way. As is often the case, this New Testament principle of spiritual life Jesus is talking about finds its best illustration in the Old Testament. In the story of Abraham and Isaac, we have a dramatic picture of what the surrendered life really looks like. You know the story. Abraham was an old man when Isaac was born, old enough to have been Isaac's grandfather, in fact. And so it it doesn't take much imagination on our part to understand how deeply Abraham loved Isaac, how much Isaac meant to him. As he watched that infant grow, so did his love for him, till at last it bordered on idolatry. It was then that God stepped in to save both father and son. Genesis 22 tells the story. God tells Abraham, take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. Thankfully, the Bible spares us the agony of a description of that night when God told Abraham he had to sacrifice his son. But it doesn't take much imagination on our part to see Abraham bent with age, sobbing, convulsing beneath the stars that night as he sat at the negotiating table with God. If only Abraham himself had been allowed to die, that would have been a thousand times easier for he was old and and ready to die. He, He had walked with God by faith. He knew what lay ahead for him. But that was not the terms of the agreement. God had asked for a sacrifice. He had asked for Isaac. And this was Abraham's trial by fire. It was a test, not to determine how much he loved Isaac. He knew that. The test was, how much do you love me? How much do you love God? While his boy, Isaac, lay sleeping in the tent that night, Abraham made the decision. He would sacrifice, he would surrender his son the following day as a sacrifice to God as he had directed. I cannot even begin to fathom the heaviness of Abraham's heart that night. God let that brokenhearted Abraham go through with it to the point where he knew there would be no turning back. And then he stopped him. In effect, God said, it's all right, Abraham. I never intended that you should actually slay your son. I only wanted to remove him from the temple of your heart Hmm. that I might reign there unchallenged. Now you may have your son. Now I know that you really love me. There is no story in the Bible that is a more magnificent picture of what God's terms are. He has to be first. Hmm. Heaven opened up and a voice spoke to Abraham there in Genesis 22. And that voice said, because you have observed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son, I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number like the stars in the sky and the sands on the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies and through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed all because you have obeyed me. I think after that emotionally wrenching experience, the words my and mine never again had the same meaning for Abraham. Hmm. The sense of possession vanished. The world would have said to Abraham, you're rich. 
But the old man had to smile because he could not explain to them in a way they would understand, but he knew he owned nothing. And yet he had everything. He was different. Negotiating with God, guys, is big business. It's holy business. It's eternal business. God's offer is eternal life, but it's ours only if we're willing to agree to his terms. I imagine that most of those in the crowd at Caesarea who were really listening to what Jesus said that day started to gather up their stuff and leave. It's not the sort of appeal that usually draws a favorable response. And today, I fear, is no different. The anthem for today's society might be that old Frank Sinatra song, I Did It My Way. God has given you a choice. I'm confident when I walked away from my conversation with Scott Landers that day that he had made the right choice. He, he decided to live on God's terms. Will you? Would you join me as we pray together? Father, I thank you so much. You, you're so gracious and so, um, so merciful, so patient, so forgiving so long-suffering, and you have given us this day yet another appeal by your Holy Spirit to surrender our lives to you so that you could transform us from the inside out so that we could be different. God, I pray that you would place that desire to be different, to matter, to count, to full, to live a life that is the God life, the way you designed us to live it. Help us, God, to be different so that we can make a difference in this world for the glory and honor of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Next week, we'll look at week uh, the second term. Hope you join us then.